Louisiana is at the forefront of coastal change. The kinds of changes that we've seen here are the kinds of changes people could see across the world in this century as global sea levels rise. A lot of places around the world are experiencing changing coasts. The world's deltas are on the front line of this. That includes Louisiana, but it also includes places like Bangladesh and the Nile River Delta in Egypt. Tokyo has millions of people below sea level. Even places like England and Venice in Italy are building flood control structures as waters rise. There are two things people can learn from Louisiana. One is that the impacts of rising waters and a changing coastline can be very significant for the people who live by the water and for people all across the country who depend on the water and its resources for food, for energy, for commerce, and for the services the beautiful ecosystems provide. And the other thing that people can learn from Louisiana is a science and engineering based plan is the best way to deal with rising waters and an uncertain future. The good thing about this being newly emergent land is there's not that many thick roots. What is that? Silty? Sandy? It's muddier than I expected it to be. So we've got some dark gray. It's Pretty really clay, it's really huh? Clay, yeah, right. Yeah. A lot of the history of coastal Louisiana is buried in the sediments of the marshes that are here. Ooh. Oh, wow, oh, that's cool. Hey. And so by looking at the coastal system, we can get a record of the environment. Not a lot of, I don't taste any silt. Right hey, that's just clay. As a coastal geologist, I look at how water and mud move across the coast, and I look at how humans alter that process. I guess I originally wanted to be an ornithologist. My first job was in the Everglades. I chased swallowtailed kites around and realized that I did not want to spend my scientific career chasing my samples. So I started being a geologist because I realized that the mud didn't move very fast. And Hey, I think we're stuck, yeah, so I'm yeah, gonna just, yeah, let's see if we can give it. The, the question, if you're a scientist that works in shallow water environments, is not if you're gonna get stuck, it's how you handle things when you do get stuck. We're fine. We just hit an oyster. Here at Lumcon's Marine Center, one of the really nice things is that we have a seawater system. So just as a bar might have, uh, have beer on tap, we have seawater on tap. A laser diffraction particle size analyzer, we're drying oven, it get out all the water. So in the field the other day, we were tasting sediment, the gamma detector, liquid nitrogen, which I used to keep the detector cool. That's a pretty good qualitative way to do it and burn it to determine the organics. No, I actually have not had many humorous mishaps when tasting samples. I, I've had no shortage of field humor. They were hanging out and I guess we got attacked by it. It was a big fish, yeah. And it was a little boat. But tasting samples was actually not one of them. Nah, there's a little silt in there. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of the issues of restoring coastal Louisiana revolve around building land at a rate that is faster than the rate at which we're sinking and water levels are rising.
A lot of the substance in New Orleans is a little bit like a sponge. And when a sponge is wet, it expands, and then when it dries out, it compresses into a smaller mass. And part of the reason we're here is we want to understand what the possibility for this area is to compact and sink, and also what that means about how water might flow in the city. Here in South Louisiana, we're sinking at a rate, on average, it's about a centimeter a year. Global sea level rise makes that 1.4 centimeters a year, so about a half an inch a year. Over 10, 12 years, you could easily be looking at six inches worth of sea level rise. Down at a place like Lumcon, six inches of sea level rise is the difference between a dry parking lot and a flooded parking lot. The marsh buffer that provided flood protection is diminished. This poster was, what, 20? When did you make the poster? This is about a year ago. So, and the, so the, the place where we started was looking at these uh, Google Earth images and just looking at the, the visual land change that you can see in Davis Pond. The sediment load in the river, calculating it based on season. A freshwater diversion is a gate in a levee, and the idea of that is to restart the natural land building processes mm -hmm. that originally built the Mississippi River Delta. The delta was built when sediments from continental U.S. were delivered to the coastal landscape. When it hit the ocean, the flow slowed down, and all of the mud in the muddy Mississippi River settled out. Now, the Mississippi River sits largely behind levees, and so it doesn't bring mud to the coast in the way that it used to. Diversions are designed to mimic that process. How deep is the water? Like 10 centimeters or something? Yeah. Like Let's try to get it in one full meter. So we have about 60 centimeters of deposition since the diversion opened. And the diversion opened in 2002. So we're looking at, yeah. An inch and a half or so yeah. a year? Yeah. The diversion packet, we think, maybe even a little thicker over here. What do you think is true? I think there's a lot more trees. I, I think you're right. And if you're talking a meter in, what, 15 years, this was probably open water or quasi-open water, so you had to fill this in high enough that you can get trees there. The projections are that river diversions will build tens to maybe low numbers of hundreds of square miles. They are long-term, one of the more efficient ways to build land. The 2017 master plan has a diversion in this area, right? Yeah, there's there's two, so it makes you think it's not a bad area for it. Yeah. But any plan is going to be a series of trade-offs. If you brought a diversion into an area, you might change it to a system that was dominated by freshwater species. What does that mean for people that make a living off of, like, shrimping and oystering? If we're going to think about wetland and coastal restoration, it needs to be a multifaceted process that doesn't just look at wetlands, but also the benefits to people. There were other pushes forward to restore the coast. But post-Katrina was when the state initiated its, its master planning process. The state's coastal master plan is basically a plan to restore ecosystems and provide flood protection for communities across coastal Louisiana. The big difference between the 2012 and the 2017 plan really comes down to the rate of global sea level rise. 2012, the high end of sea level rise was about 1.4 feet over 50 years. And in 2017, the low end of global sea level rise was 1.4 feet. Then the high end was 2.7 feet. So the rate of projected sea level rise went up substantially. How you doing? A couple hundred years ago, probably as recently as 100, this bayou in here would have carried fresh water and the trees would have been able to survive. 
There's basically ghost forests that used to be thriving trees and are now dead. Working here in Kokodri, I know what sea level rise means and the cascading kinds of influences, what it means about how you get to work, about how your car functions, about how your building functions. One study that I often think of said that this century, with sea level rise, somewhere between 4 and 13 million people across the U.S. would have to move. If between 4 and 13 million people need to move, what happens to their banknotes? What happens to their businesses? What happens here depends very much on how we deal with our sea level issue. While you might think of this as a very isolated, remote place, it's very deeply connected to decisions that people make in the rest of the world. How we manage greenhouse gases, how we manage our climate. I'm facing love with bloody hands and face. We'll have to restore the coast. If we wait 20, 30 years and sea level rise starts to accelerate, then it will be very, very difficult to, to rebuild land in Louisiana. But if we manage our climate in a way that keeps sea level rise low, then we have a lot of potential to rebuild a marsh. The nice thing about marshes is they have some ability to keep pace with sea level rise. Put marshes in place now, it's like an investment, and it has an ability to provide return years down the road. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. My five favorite things in order. Hmm. You saw that? That was all tree dogs. From the least favorite to the favorite, or how do you want it? Whatever you want. Oh, I hear more tree dogs. I mean, let's skip to one. My favorite thing from one to five. I want a duck on. <laughs> it happens to you, baby. <laughs> Different, Just got to make sure we don't shoot the camera guy. Welcome to my world at the mouth of the Mississippi River. Carlisle, Louisiana is where I live. The population is one, me. We're 22 feet off the ground right now in my house. It was at 14, but it flooded twice. I had to go up higher. I have dual pintails. You know when they're coming. They make that sound, they're coming. This is a buffalo head, male. 
I don't want to forget about my ruddy duck because they eat duck potato. And fresh water equals duck potato equals ducks. True. My grandpa was strict Catholic. You know, no women were allowed at the camp. Back in the old days, they left their wives at home. They did all the cooking. Well, I didn't think that was fair. I just didn't. The two wood ducks, Weijin, canvas back. There. There's two males and one shot. <sighs> Duck fan. How you like that, huh? Check it out. 2018 duck season. Got to have a flask, right? This is the best eating duck in the world right here. Teal, blue wing. And I like to pluck them on a river batcher because I just like sitting out here and, and, and looking at what I need to get over here on the other side. And the only reason why I'm not getting that is because of that levee. The philosophy is I want the ship to come from Southwest Pass to get to New Orleans because it's commerce for the port. And you got to control the river, so they built these levees, the Corps of Engineers. But it stops all the needed nutrients from feeding the marsh that's been doing it for years. For Katrina, the water went over the levee and I had sand in my mailbox. They asked me if I was happy, even though my house got flooded. Oh, here it is. Good morning. <laughs> I'm so happy to be at the Bohemian Spillway today, where Mother Nature rules. Working for Plaquemines Parish government, I got really interested in the coast because I went all over the whole parish in a boat taking water samples. I got to see it every day. Every day I was going out and I was seeing different landmarks. And then all of a sudden there was no land 30 years later in the end of your career, you know. They're not here. <laughs> They're not here. This is the top fishery in North America. It's the top wintering grounds for ducks, and it's all going away. No, well, because no wetlands equals no ducks. That's obvious. You know, Albertine got into this game before me, and, and I was so envious that she had a voice, and I did. People don't understand. When I camped out when, as a kid, where I slept in my sleeping bag on a ridge in the swamp, so two foot underwater now. And all the giant uh, ancient oak trees, they're all dead. Because they don't like the water's coming in, put them underwater, smother them. When you're putting river water into the system, you're getting the, the nutrients and the sediments in. Now you ain't sank yet, right? It's hard as a rock. But we're about to take you on the other side over there, Death Valley, Carlisle style. If you look behind me, you got marsh to the next ridge, and after that, it's open water for a ways. And it just keeps opening up. The tide is taking the land out, the grass. So I would say in the next 10 years, I probably wouldn't ever be able to drive back here. It's sinking so fast. It'll be a thing of the past. We've lost 2,000 square miles of land in the last 70 years. We probably lost 10,000 square miles of habitat because of saltwater intrusion. Everybody looks at the land, but you have to look at the fish species and, and how far they've gone inland. They're 100 miles inland now, the, the saltwater species. Well, wherever those are, chances are the aquatic vegetation is gone as well. You gotta divert some river water, you got to. It's the heartbeat, it's the vein, it's the pulse. When you go look at it, it's alive and kicking. We're almost in the Mississippi River. You ready? Look at the sediment in the water. Look at that. This is a certified map right here. Watch this. You see this right here? That's my dad's orange orchard right here on the Mississippi River. A river would come up on his crop. That man hardly had to put fertilizer on them orange trees. That was so nice. There are some things I may not know. There are some places, oh Lord, I cannot go. 
But I... You think about how vital the river is for life in this parish. We should be getting on our knees and thanking God we got the Mississippi River, the way I feel. For I can feel him deep weeping. God and Mother Nature are not the same, but they're working hand in hand together. <laughs> they got to. Yes, God is real. If we don't have Louisiana wetlands, we're not going to have people, we're not going to have commerce, ships coming up the river. I don't know what else we have to do to get the attention of the world to, to show them how vital it is for storm surge, for commerce, oil and gas, for everything. His love for me. The wetlands are vital to the nation. Just like pure gold. If we go on, it's a slow yes, cancer that eats. For I can feel him in my soul. Some folks may die. I feel more at peace in the swamp than I do in the city of New Orleans. If we lose this area, New Orleans is next, because we protect New Orleans. So if we do nothing, it's just done. You need it. Oh, yes, God is real. He's real in my soul. Yes, God is real, for he has washed and made me hold his love for me is just like pure gold yes god is real for i can feel him in my soul Every photo is like a drive-by. I've probably flown 200 times in South Louisiana. And how many good pictures do you think you have? 20. How many decent ones do you think you have? 50. On the website, it was saying this belt is usually used on treadmills. The pipe to the carburetor is some sort of vacuum cleaner assembly. I first saw South Louisiana from the air flying in and out of New Orleans on commercial flights. It's an infinitely complex ecosystem. What I really wanted to do was just go up in the air and explore. So were you thinking sail to the same campsite or somewhere else so that you get closer to the next island? I kind of want to fly to this other island. That's going to be four miles, like six miles, eight miles. Either way. My mom's texting me. I was always intrigued by the barrier islands. It's an interesting landscape that I wanted to fly and photograph. We bought this sailboat in an effort to use less gasoline. People used to use this kind of boat 100 years ago in Louisiana for oystering and fishing. So we thought it would be a smart move to use that to get around out here.
In an ideal world, my paramotor wouldn't burn any gasoline, but this is the most efficient way for me to get up in the air and fly around until I stop flying around and just sail the rest of my life. We should go wander around and look for dead things on the beach. Tonight is bushes, grilling beans, and a can of green beans, and it should be delicious. My neighbor is a scrapper and scraps aluminum and often finds canned food, the food that he doesn't want, he gives to me. So I've got a whole bag of canned food over here. These barrier islands are eroding at rates of something like up to 60 feet per year. When you look at the maps, it's just a thin beach line, but in reality, you can see where they've been rebuilding the beaches all throughout this area to try to preserve this bit of life for a little longer. The reason I started working on this project was essentially environmental communication. I think these images can be used by the scientific community to kind of raise awareness about how this landscape works. Great flight the other day. That was cool. Yeah. A lot of my work has yeah. been down here. For me as a scientist, I very closely link education and research. Part of research is to educate people. I collaborate with some folks from NASA, and they can calculate a vegetation index, how much vegetation is there. But one of the problems with satellites is you don't really know exactly what they're looking at, whether it's algae or whether it's marsh grasses. Yeah, I mean, from 50 feet up, you can tell what type of vegetation it is exactly. And... Right, in a way that would be much more precise than you could get from an airplane. <laughs> South Louisiana feels like you're in some kind of remote wilderness until you get up in the air and then you can see that you're just surrounded by miles and miles of oyster leases, shrimpers trawling. The horizon is just dotted with endless oil rigs. Everything is exploited in one way or another. Everywhere you look, you see these oil and gas pipeline canals. Those canals are what allowed saltwater intrusion to penetrate so far north and then killed the vegetation which was holding the soil in place. And then that's what really triggered most of the wetland loss. Deep in the woods lies the shadowlands, white brother bears I've met old people down in this area that tell me this used to be meadow where they grazed cattle. And now it's just open water with the edges of the canals remaining. When I started this project, I had in my mind a handful of images that would tell the story of wetland loss. And then experiencing this place drew me in and kept me exploring. It's really become a process of going out and looking for like magic.
love New Orleans, but try to be realistic about living here. You know, one major hurricane without that protection of the wetlands, we'll all be finding a new place to live. so much value in this ecosystem. Hopefully I'm able to capture a little bit of that with my photographs and kind of make people think about this place a little more. When I'm flying, I often have this feeling of overwhelming beauty with this like deep sadness for what's been lost. Two feelings at the same time constantly. So usually what would this look like during shrimp season? Right now, you would have about 15 boats lined up starting from over there, going into the village. You know, they would space itself out, enough time for the shrimp to pop back up and catch. And now it's none, none. Grand Bayou was the honey hole. If they're having a great season somewhere else, we having a awesome season. This was the best. This was, it didn't get no better than that. What's up, fella? How you doing, man? Boy, a long time don't see. What's going on? Nothing much. We're doing a documentary, my cousin. Yeah? yeah. On what? On us, uh, the fishing light of us. What do you think about it? Uh, we gonna survive? Why not? We gonna survive or what? Ever since I was little, we would wait by grandma for the high tide to come up. And when the good tide would come, we was always anxious to run to the dish to see who spot the crab. Then my dad introduced shrimping. When we became teenagers, he stopped coming with us. Next thing you know, we was out there by ourselves. We gave us opportunity to be out there by ourselves. It's my dad's camp. The old boat there is named the Wake. I had some of my best catches on that boat. Some grew back up pretty bad. We hauled shells out here. This was a bulkhead that we put up, and now the salt water is eroding. This was high land. I can remember I caught so much shrimp up the body, I had the little boat. I came and delivered a catch three times, offloaded, and I mean crowned the dock three times. And I would go back and get some more, and they would do the help sorting it out, sorting it out. We, we would line up and take a turn up the body. I think we have 13 acres. If you look at it, 13 acres from the back of the bunker to the to the back. In the five years I planted watermelon here, they all popped up, but I, I didn't have time to irrigate it. 
now the uh, fishing is going bad, I think we need to maybe consider this as a more primary thing, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. When they built the levee, they stopped all the fresh water from dumping onto this side of the levee. On the marsh side, it became salt water, which the brownie, the Brazilian shrimp, it thrives in salt water. And back here became a, a unique place for it. We can catch 3,000 pounds in maybe six hours. So when they put the siphon right up the road, it flooded it with fresh water, and it wiped out the brown seeds. But it made the white shrimp season better. So it swapped from being a brownie season to more a white shrimp season. When they first talked about putting a diversion down here, I was saying it can help us. Outside the bayou, the salinity was on the high side. The fresh water, we can use some if they manage it. But if they're coming on the scale of what they're telling me, I'm realizing it's way too much. I'll tell you what, the first day of trawling season open, I caught the net in the wheel. I jumped yeah. in the water to take the weapon out. I thought it was in the river. That's how fresh the water was. Right. That's how come all the horses in the back of Empire and Brazil yeah, dying. dying. Yeah, I know First that. Water. Right now, we're hitting the record flood with the river, and it's already changing our fishing industry. It's having an impact of the size of a Katrina to us. We have a crop that we can't even sell. The shrimp is small enough to fit on a quarter, and you got room to see the rim of the quarter. If fishing keep declining, I have two other options that I will be venturing into. Some farming on the land or running tug for my brother. We started off with it as a shrimp boat. The first job of the Daniel Monique, it still had the skimmer frames on it for the shrimp. From there, he grew to five boats. He's got the Danielle Monique, the Uncle Robert, the Uncle Blue, the Silver Dollar, the Mr. Joe, the Miss Alma, and, what you, and the Uncle John. Washer and dryer. Who does the cooking? We, we, everybody takes a turn, and whoever turns out the best is be nominated to cook from then on. And who's the best cook? Um, second living quarters right behind you. Another living. I prefer fishing over the tug, but uh, you know, sometimes we gotta give it up to make ends meet, you know. I would always keep my boat. My mind would always be, when can I go back to commercial fishing? It's not, I'm gonna stay here. Traveling far to the, for the catch, that's one of my biggest fear of fixing to come happening to me with the fresh water coming on from fishing in the bays and bayou mostly. Sooner or later, we'll start having to fish the Gulf. And you can't run from every storm. Eventually, you're going to get caught in one. You remember, remember what I used to tell you on the boat? What's the most important thing? Um, to follow the order, and what do you say, aye, aye, captain? Yep. I think with the larger boat, we can go go more places. I think we'll be successful enough to stay stay shrimping, but we'll, we'll see what happens, you know. And that, that's a ticket to get on the boat, Joe? Time. It's kind of hard right now, but I'm going to try to go see if I can manage to make ends meet shrimping. Danced like no one was watching. Some kids don't even know what their parent does for a living. And that's what I love about the commercial fishing industry. It, it brings you, you together. Not a word of you. 
Hey, Joe, stop. All right. Sometimes he'll mess me up back here when he stays up there. Because it works together. Everybody came and lived with us to go shrimping with my dad during the summer. All the kids would come to my house. Back then, we had winches to pick up the frame on the boat, but we didn't have winches to pick up the tail. And so we would get together and we would lift it. And I remember when we got a little older, we'd tell my dad, well, why you don't put winches? Well, if I get winches, I ain't going to need y'all. As it got modern, we got less cash, though. We had way more cash back then. Hey, my baby, look at it. That's the white shrimp. These are the brownies. I don't want bad for my kids. So what I see today, I would say, no, I wouldn't want them. Shrimping? But in my heart, for what it gave to me. What's beneath the way? Yes, I want them in it. I want them in nothing else. But we have to make changes. We got to be willing to adapt and change and do different things. Oh, there was a time. Oh, what kind of boat we going to call it? What we going to call it? The Savannah Road? The Joseph Boat. The Joseph Boat. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. We're going to see how well we do, because if it's going to be pretty, we'll name it the Savannah Road. But if it's going to stay like it is, we're going to call it the Joe Boat. Hey, you gonna start eating shrimp or what? Oh no! Oh, no. Putting the land back is part of keeping our livelihood. We need the land to come back just as well as we need the salinity level to stay the same. I call white trout. Yeah, come here, come here. Hey, give him here. I'm going to show you the difference. One has freckles, one don't. Huh? When we went on our little maiden voyage, we've seen a lot of white shrimp with the brown shrimp. I'm thinking we might have the big boat at the right time to catch the mother load and, and, and pull through everything. Oh, what an ocean. A fisherman always has hope. He's got to have hope. That's what keeps us going. You wake up every morning trying to think today's another day. Let's go get them. What's beneath the way? Hey. What's beneath the way? I mean, you could tell when he's been in town too long, he kind of gets ornery. <laughs> My dad needs to get out on the water from time to time. It's just something he has to do. First time I bought a crab this year. I think it'll get better. and look and look and look. <laughs> I'm still looking for my dentist. <laughs> Lake Zero, maybe we ought to go Lake Zero. Huh? Oh, I saw one. Ah, you saw one? Yeah. Ah, if you saw a shrimp, look out. Oh, 
Was that lovefish? What was that? I don't know. That was that, that's that's fish. Y'all ready? How about you, Nat? You ready? <laughs> All right. That's a ticker chain right here. Supposed to tickle the shrimp. That is. My earliest memory of learning that this land is disappearing was in school. It wasn't from my elders. I think you have to really ask them to really get the information of things that they didn't want to remember, maybe, like land loss and what they used to have, which now isn't here anymore. See that sign right there? That used to be all the bank right there, all the way there. So it was all the bank. That's that all, was, the that was all land. There's no land, no water behind it. And over here, that's why I told you, where the buy used to go back there, it's all gone right there, too. But that's where Daddy used to bring us to, right here. Yeah. The whole family. I grew up with my dad going hunting and fishing. That's something that molded me, so we have a deep connection with that land that is being lost now. There was an opportunity that came up, funded by the National Academy of Sciences, to be a part of a research project, getting oral histories of our elders who've lived off of this land to kind of heal what's going on here. Prior to the invasion, we had our own culture, history, laws. We were recorded by the Spaniards in 1540 to be where the Red River and the Mississippi meet. In the 1680s, when the French came, they saw the red poles of the Homa, Baton Rouge, and we saw there was gonna be another shedding of blood, we decided to migrate out of the way. The migration went south. We moved into areas where nobody else wanted to live. And then, of course, the Acadians arrived and, and made us exiles in our own country. That's when our next step was to go even further south. So how do you think that affects, you know, our culture as a whole and our togetherness as a, as a people? Well, we've got to remember one thing. A tribe is a large family. We're still family. Secret for each other. Seven paths to where things began for us. My mom was a filet maker, taking the sassafras leaves and making them into the powder that we call filet. Uh, long before the research was being done, she knew what was happening. Her trees started to die. That ground got saturated with salt. The navigation canal built to bring boats and they would be good for the economy, and it really didn't happen. What did come was the salt water. Going without you change you read with him where'd y'all live on the bayou down in Dulac? across from your grandmother Right there on yes, line. it's no longer there. You know, you wouldn't have been able to know what it looked like. I'm still looking for a picture of that little old house. So this is my great-grandpa here, right? Yes. Wow. And everybody that's there is gone. My grandparents fought a long time through hurricane after hurricane. But when Rita came through, my grandpa lost his boat, and so they moved further inland. It's weird to not gather there for every Christmas and not be there for the boat blessings with a band on the levee. And now my daughter won't know about that. So that's a loss. It's a loss to me, but it's a bigger loss to my daughter. And I can relate to that when I hear my Aunt Kareen talking about something that I don't really know about, but she can tell me was my family's land. 
the whole point was just so beautiful. These oak trees were so green and pretty. Oh man, there's almost none left. All of this was just trees, oak trees, all over the place. It was just beautiful. They were so thick that it was just leaves on the ground. Oh. It's like feeling death around you already because it's going to be taken away from you. So it's sad. And just to want to stay where you know that this is your land, this is your people. Where's the bayou? I can't see the bayou. It takes our local people to band together and do as much as they can to learn instead of just caving in under these big industries. And it's hard, it's scary, but what's more scary, that or losing the places that we have? We're way out here, we're still feeling the effects of, of colonization as indigenous people trying to hang on to our culture, our language, our value systems, things like that. It's a I'm a camp counselor at the Native Youth Community Project Camp. For us to expose them to college communities while also exposing them to the land and how our culture has been molded through where we live. Does anybody have anything that they have maybe taken that they didn't know before about coastal issues and our people living yeah. along with us? The soil is more than just soil under our ancestors. Yeah. And like more and more of our heritage and our ancestors are like going away with the water. That's a great point, yeah. I think it's interesting how if we just open up the Mississippi in a controlled way, all like the sediments would just rebuild the land. Yeah, and you guys are at a vital point in your lives right now where whether it be learning more about it and going into a field that'll help this coast and our way of life, but also about passing on these traditions that you're learning. What's going on here can relate to all bayou communities, all coastal communities, and I think that other communities can see the immediate need to save our land, but don't really see how the loss of this land will also be the loss of our culture. The further inland we must push, it's going to change our ways of life. Now's the time to preserve that as much as we can. Our flag has a crawfish, and if you know anything about crawfish, crawfish do not retreat. You're not going to make us back up and give up. We'll keep moving forward. Yeah, that's a nice little bowl. There it is. <laughs> Turn up with five or six people, isn't it? Let's put it in the jambalaya. Jambalaya or jelly or juice. Yeah.